a warm, nostalgic sound that sings of soft summer evenings and better, more carefree days. An ever-present irritant whose shrill whine incessantly drills into your mind as the unrelenting heat assaults your body. An eerie, foreboding call echoing out of old and untouched places deep in the dark woods, like a chill wind ripping the lingering heat from the deepening shadows of night. It creeps up until it's all around you, right next to you, but somehow never where you're looking. It repeats and repeats and repeats, always a little different, sometimes long, sometimes short, yet always fundamentally the same. It builds in stages over and over toward the same climax, never letting up for long, never changing its tune, no matter how much you wish it would. Higurashi, the cicada, an inescapable fixture of Japan's summer soundscape. Their songs echo even through the dense city streets of Tokyo, but it's only out in the country where the roar of the roads and the drumbeat of industry gives way to dancing leaves and rhythmic riverways that the multifaceted majesty of their melody can be felt to its fullest. But that's not the only thing that's different out in the boonies in summertime. The people are more familiar there, a little too familiar maybe. Most folks do mind their own business, but there are certain ways to things. Things that are done and others that are simply not. A common communal understanding means many rules need not be spoken, but if they're broken unwittingly or otherwise, your business can very easily become someone else's. That's just how it is in places where everyone knows everyone. Japan is a very different place for insiders than outsiders, and that difference becomes increasingly pronounced the further out and deeper in one goes. It can be profoundly unsettling to be the only stranger in a place full of so many shared secrets and values, and there is genuine terror in the prospect of being pushed out. To be ostracized in such an isolated and insular place is to have a whole world turn against you at once. At the same time, though, it can be profoundly comforting to know that you're among a tight-knit community of friends and neighbors. Higurashi no Nakukoro ni, or When the Cicadas Cry, is a deeply introspective story that explores that contradiction. It is also a lurid slasher anime and visual novel and manga about a club full of teenagers being brutalized in increasingly gruesome and creative ways during a literally endless summer. And that's always fun. I mean, nobody likes most teenagers, not even other teenagers, and thus there is an undeniable visceral appeal to stories about bad things happening to them that has sustained many a lucrative, low-budget horror franchise over the years. But there's more to this particular low-budget horror franchise. A lot more. I mean, you'd kind of think there'd have to be, just looking at the thing. Higurashi began its life as an independent visual novel, created almost entirely by one guy, Ryukishi7, with coding help from his brother and a few friends. Ryukishi wrote all the scenarios and drew all the sprites himself, and, uh... I, I probably don't have to tell you which of those two things is his specialty. Not to judge or anything, I doubt I could make a visual novel look even half this good on my own, and at least his style is consistent. And strong, immersive sound design does go a long ways toward making up the difference. Sloppy visuals mixed with phenomenal audio have proven to be an enduring feature of the franchise through its various adaptations. The first season especially of the original anime is a Studio Dean production through and through, but it's still a certified classic, and I would urge anyone who's interested in the big air quotes remake that's currently airing to watch that original first. In some ways, the janky animation enhances the uneasy atmosphere, and there are enough shifts in style and genuinely gorgeous shots mixed in to suggest there may have been at least some intent behind that. Whether or not there was, the awkward, ugly look of the show has a way of growing on you, as does the look of the games. To fans of Higurashi, it's an intrinsic part of the series' charm, but that begs the question. 
How did this ugly thing convince so many people to give it the time to grow on them in the first place? The answer, with an absolutely brilliant story hook supported by an even more brilliant mystery plot. At the time of Higurashi's release in 2002, Key, the creators of Air, Canon, and Clanad, were blowing up in the visual novel scene, and their works were widely considered to be masterpieces. Ryukishi 7 noticed a pattern among their releases, a formula for their success, if you will. Key's novels tend to start out with a happy-go-lucky slice-of-life vibe, leaning hard on anime comedy tropes to endear their characters to readers before a surprising but well-foreshadowed tragedy strikes, and the rest of the story uses your attachment to those goofy anime teens to repeatedly kick your heart in the balls. But what if, Ryukishi wondered, instead of getting sad, the quaint, pleasant, funny world these characters inhabit took a turn toward terror? What if those happy friends were instead torn apart, figuratively and very, very literally, by suspicion, paranoia, and fear? It is June, 1983, and Keiichi Maebara has lived a month so far as the new kid in the very old village of Hinamizawa. One of the only new kids they've ever had, as a point of fact. The people of Hinamizawa don't get out much, and as a rule, they don't get many visitors either. Still, Keiichi is settling in pretty well, all things considered. He's already made four fantastic friends in the town's only mixed-grade classroom. Bubbly, Genki airhead Rena Ryugu is also a transfer student who arrived a year before Keiichi and makes a hobby of diving for cute treasures in the local dump. Precocious brat Satoko Hojo loves to spring devious traps on her friends, but can also turn her devious mind toward helping them. Their leader, Mion Sonozaki, is the brash, confident scion of the town's most respected and powerful old family. And last, but certainly not least, young Rika Furude's disarmingly cutesy demeanor belies her importance as the priestess of Furude Shrine, representative of Hinamizawa's local god, Oyashiro-sama, who is said to have protected the village somewhat violently since ancient times. Together as an informal club, the kids spend many a carefree afternoon playing games in the classroom, often slightly twisted ones with playfully sadistic punishments to encourage everyone to try their hardest. On the weekends, they picnic together and roam about the village having fun. It's a happy, simple life, or so it seems. They've let Keiichi into their club and their lives, but there are a lot of things they're still not telling him about themselves and the village. One of those things is that five years ago, someone died here. The foreman on a contentious and canceled dam project that would have drowned the whole town where it completed was beaten bloody and chopped to pieces by his crew, one of whom is still missing, along with the right arm. And as it turns out, that was just the start of quite a lot of someone's dying here. Every year since, on the night of the town's cotton drifting festival, one person's been killed and another's gone missing. Victims and sacrifices, the locals speculate, of Oyashiro's curse. But of course, curses aren't real, right? There's gotta be something else going on here. This year, the curse has claimed a local nurse, Mio Takano, and her buff photographer buddy, Tomitake, who just happens to be the first person who clued Keiichi in about the town's dark past. His friends have been particularly cagey about this topic, going so far as to deny the deaths when Keiichi has asked them about it point blank. And that may simply be an effort to spare him unnecessary scares, but what if it's not? Why are Rena and Mion always looking at him like that? Why do they get so cold when he broaches unpleasant topics? Why are they so angry with him for talking to Detective Oishi about the case? Why is Rena always lugging around a hatchet? Why was there a needle in the lunch she brought over? Why did that guy in the van try to run Keiichi over? And what really happened to Satoshi, the other boy who was in their club until last year's festival? Gnawing doubt slowly transforms to biting certainty. They're hiding something. They know something. They did something. They know he knows they don't want him to know things. They think he knows too much, and they're going to do something about it soon, unless he does something first. 
Good thing Satoshi left his trusty baseball bat in the classroom. Keiichi puts it to good use when they try to stick him with a needle in his own bedroom, pulverizing his attackers, and even manages to evade the mysterious coach and his goons when they come to grab him. But even after all that, even as the regret over what he's done to his friends sets in, there's still someone there. Footsteps creeping closer and closer and closer behind Keiichi. A presence just over his shoulder, watching, listening, and waiting. And before Detective Oishi can get to him, whoever or whatever it is gets him. After clawing out his own throat, all he leaves behind is a note, imploring whoever reads it to expose the truth behind everything a task that ultimately falls to us as the audience. Why did this happen? Why did Rena and Mion have to die like that? Why were they acting like that in the first place? Were they even acting like that? Or was something else eating at the clearly frenzied Maibara, darkening his thoughts and turning him against his friends? Could the curse of Oyashiro really be real? Those mysteries have answers. Everything that happens in Hinamizawa happens for a reason. But those reasons are rarely clear, and there was simply too little time before this tragedy struck to find all the clues we'd need to put them together. Luckily, or rather deeply, deeply unluckily, that's not the only time we're given. It is June, 1983, and Keiichi Maebara has lived a month so far as the new kid in the very old village of Hinamizawa. He's settling in well, having already befriended a club full of spirited young troublemakers like himself who spend their afternoons playing games in class and take weekend trips together to the nearby city of Okonomiya where they play more games. On one such outing, Keiichi happens to run into a girl who looks just like Mion working at a local maid cafe. Thinking it's his friend, he hits on her, but it turns out it's her mildly estranged twin, Shion. Despite the misunderstanding, they become fast friends, which makes sense because she's a lot like his best friend Mion, and plenty of hilarious anime antics happen as our hero has fun with the both of them and occasionally gets them mixed up. But then, again, the Cotton Drifting Festival comes and goes. Tomitake dies and Takano vanishes after they sneak into the shrine's forbidden torture tool shred with Shion and Keiichi in tow. And in the wake of it all, Shion voices a suspicion that the Sonozaki Yakuza clan may be the ones behind these disappearances and murders. From there, without going into the incredibly explicit details, things get creepy and murdery once again. And it won't be the last time. Time and again, we're brought back to Hinamizawa in the June of 1983, each story focusing on different events in these kids' lives that lead up to some new, grisly tragedy. Many things change in each iteration, character relationships and motivations, as well as the choices they make at key junctures can seemingly change radically and at random. Some events, like a baseball game and a Hanafuda tournament, recur more often than others. A few are totally set in stone. On the night of the festival, Tomitake always dies horribly, Mio is always demoned away, and those events always lead to greater horrors down the line. Though what exactly those horrors are varies greatly depending on which kid's approaching their breaking point, and for what reason, when the slasher vibe starts to set in. There is a lot going on in Hinamizawa. Lies built upon lies, secrets nested within secrets, complex and tangled chains of causality that all somehow lead toward increasingly awful dead ends. It's only by examining how all of these timelines differ and overlap that we can begin to understand even the most basic truths about this town. But two things are clear from the beginning. Firstly, there are supernatural forces at work here. Time doesn't just loop on its own, after all. And secondly, there is evil in Hinamizawa. Cloaked in the shadows, hidden in the silence of the countryside, some unseen force is driving this town toward tragedy. Invisible eyes are always watching. Oyashiro-sama's presence pervades the valley. 
whatever that actually means. And whether or not it's a curse, some kind of recurrent madness plagues Keiichi and his friends, compelling them, time and again, to kill. At first, it'll probably just be morbid curiosity that pushes you forward through this thing. The question of what fucked up shit will happen to these teens next is compelling enough in itself, at least for a while, but right when the cheap thrills and sensationalism start to fade, something else takes hold. You start to genuinely and deeply care about these characters. There are a lot of things about Ryukishi 7's writing that are borderline transcendent. Higurashi's timeline is impressively thorough, its clues are well laid, and its reveals immensely satisfying. And it is simply remarkable how most arcs of Higurashi work both as standalone stories and pieces of a larger mystery, though the question arcs are naturally better at standing alone than the answers. And filtering all of that information into tightly paced, horrifically tense tales can't have been easy. But beyond all of those writing feats, what's truly remarkable, and only becomes fully apparent several loops in, is the internal complexity of Higurashi's characters. Like, all of them. Keiichi Maebara might look like every damp cracker of a harem protagonist ever, but he's got layers to him, the topmost of which is confident charisma. The girls tease him a lot, but he gives as good as he gets, and even uses his natural way with words to flirt with both Rena and Mion. Digging deeper, he's got some fascinating flaws and strengths of character. Under the wrong conditions, he can be a straight-up selfish asshole, and that didn't start with the curse, but he also has a kind, empathetic core that makes him a truly dependable friend. I'd say more, but discovering these nuances, getting a clear idea of what each character wants and where their allegiances truly lie, is as much a part of the mystery as any detail about Oyashiro's curse, and I wouldn't want to spoil the joy of solving that for yourself. The whole core cast appears at first blush to be little more than a collection of marketable moe and anime tropes, but rest assured that every one of them has their own compelling internal conflicts with which to contend, their own unique ties to the world of Hinamizawa and the mysteries within it, their own values, virtues, weaknesses, and desires that drive their decision making and shape the various stories that unfold in this sleepy mountain town. Even the ways in which they go mad are uniquely true to who they are. And it's not just them. Every character we meet, no matter how minor they seem, has their own rich internal world to discover. Across both seasons of Higurashi, you will become as familiar with Hinamizawa and its inhabitants as any of the locals. It gives you good reason to root for every hero and even empathize with the various villains. You will yearn to see these characters you've come to know and love find a way out of the endless maze of repeating horror in which they're trapped, and that will only make their repeated failures hurt harder. Higurashi really gets into you. There's a good reason why so many people are so obsessed with it, and with the other seventh expansion series to which it's a gateway. I hope that all I've said so far has been enough to convince you that you need to experience it, and that it's worth experiencing now so that you can dive into the evolving discussions and analysis of the new Higurashi Go fully equipped. What with it being spooky month and all, it's a perfect time to binge and get caught up, but that still leaves the question of which version to binge. Owing to the complexity of character I was just talking about, some Higurashi fans consider the anime to be an inferior version of this story. It has a tighter pace to keep up that leaves a lot less room for internal monologuing and other details that enrich the story. Now, I would argue that most of that depth is actually still present in the anime. It's just subtextual, conveyed by vocal performance, music, Kenji Kawai is still a god, cinematography, and even stylistic choices. In an arc that follows Rena, for instance, her very serious approach to having fun is conveyed by a shift to Gainax-esque animation. So long as you're asking yourself why characters make the decisions they do and make an effort to answer that question for yourself, you won't miss much about these characters or this world. 
The anime's storytelling really rewards deep analysis and interpretation from every angle, and you know I'm all about that. In keeping with the infinitely looping nature of the story as a whole, it's a lot of fun to go back and re-watch earlier parts once a few layers of the mystery have been peeled back, reinterpreting character actions and clues from a perspective of deeper understanding. The anime plays some fun tricks with sound and visuals that don't quite work the same way in other media, and in my opinion, if you like horror at all, it's essential viewing and an all-time classic. All that said, Higurashi's strong rewatch and read ability means that you don't have to choose a version, and even if you do try to settle on one initially, you'll probably want to try another one before long. The visual novels and manga are both much more direct about putting you inside the characters' heads, which makes the psychological horror of their encroaching madness and paranoia that much more palpable and effective. They are both undeniably scarier than the anime, which might make for a better first experience if you're into being scared. If you are, the sound design of the visual novel is a major point in its favor, but it's the longest iteration of this story, so it will take you a while to get through and get to the new anime. The manga, meanwhile, offers probably the most viscerally disturbing imagery of any version of this story, which is a big plus if you're into body horror, and depending on your reading speed will likely be the quickest binge of the lot. Ultimately, any choice is a good choice when it comes to Higurashi, but if the manga sounds appealing, then today's sponsor, Bookwalker, has a great deal for you. Bookwalker, if you didn't know, is Kadokawa's official ebook service, where you can download hundreds upon hundreds of English language light novels and high resolution manga to read on your phone, tablet, or PC. Whatever you want to curl up under the covers and get spooked with. From today until the 24th of October, Bookwalker is running a special autumn anime season kickoff promotion, where you can get 30% of your purchase back as Bookwalker coins when you buy books related to newly airing shows. Except for Higurashi, because they're offering up to 40% coin back on the Higurashi manga. And on top of that, if you're new to Bookwalker, you can get 600 yen off your purchase, almost the price of one full volume, if you use the promo code BASEMENT when you check out with those manga. And naturally, that code will work for anything else they have, if you're looking to read the source material for Wandering Witch, The Journey of Elena, Adachi and Shimamura, Don Machi, The Irregular at Magic High School, or anything else from this season and beyond instead. But Higurashi is a very good read, and this brief promotion is a very good opportunity to get into it. Click the link in the doobly-doo to head to Bookwalker and start reading today. Now, if you don't know what all's airing this season or what's worth watching, I just dropped the ones to watch for Fall 2020 to help you figure out exactly that. And if you like spooky stuff, particularly the tone I said at the start of this video, I recently put out a video about ReZero Season 2 that goes to some very dark places in a very similar way. Links on screen if you want to watch either. I'm Jeff Thu, professional shitbag, signing out from my mother's basement.